Miracle, good evening. A listing of upcoming events in the Bay Area for the week ending March 23rd. All events are wheelchair accessible. Please listen closely for contact numbers. The Solano Peace and Justice Center will be holding a march and rally in Vallejo on March 17th and will be meeting at 10.30 a.m. at the corner of Sonoma and Redwood. The march will begin at 11 a.m. down Sonoma and end at the Peace Pole at the Vallejo Ferry Building, where a gathering will be held rain or shine. For more information, call 707-645-7071 or visit www.solanopeaceandjustice.org. The City College of San Francisco Film Department will present China Blue, the heartbreaking story of sweatshop workers in a denim factory on March 21st from 6.45 to 9.45 at the Ocean Avenue Campus, 50 Phelan Avenue, Rosenberg Library, Room 304. This event is free. For more details, call 415-239-3580. The Alameda County Lead Poisoning Prevention Program will be hosting a free class that teaches property owners how to detect and remedy lead hazards in the home on March 17th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. at the Ecology Center, 2530 San Pablo Avenue, near Dwight Way in Berkeley. For more details, call 510-548-2220, extension 233, or visit www.ecologycenter.org. The community calendar is produced by members of the KPFA Apprenticeship Program. Send your listing at least three weeks in advance to KPFA, Box 51, 1929 Martin Luther King Jr. Way in Berkeley, California, 94704. Fax them to 510-848-3812 or email us at calendar at kpfa.org. Attention to the community calendar. Tell us if your event is wheelchair accessible. To hear this calendar again, call 510 848 6767 extension 621. The calendar is also online at kpfa.org. And this is KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno. Now stay tuned for Express. Apex. Asian Apex. Pacific Expression. Cultural coverage, music and calendar, new visions and voices, coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Welcome to Apex Express, a weekly Asian Pacific Islander American radio show right here on listener-sponsored KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno. This week we talk to four Asian American filmmakers, Hyun Ok Im, Joy Dietrich, Dirk Nguyen and Stefan Gauger. All four have films that have been selected for this year's Asian American Film Festival that opens tonight in San Francisco, as well as in Berkeley and San Jose. Their subjects are widely diverse. A Korean prostitute turned war bride, a little Vietnamese girl who makes a living selling roses, an adoptee from Korea struggling to come to terms with an incestuous relationship with her host family brother, and a Vietnamese boat refugee who returns to make her peace with the South China Sea and her ordeal to reach the Philippines in the 1980s. Hi, I'm Pratap Chatterjee, your host today. First up, we're joined in the studio with Taro Goto, and he is the Associate Director, Assistant Director of the Asian American Film Festival. Taro, welcome to KPFA. Pleasure to be here. Tell us a little bit about the history of uh, the festival. It is now, is it 25 years? This, this is year? the 25th annual festival, yes. So talk a bit about the film and its origins and, and uh, what it intends to showcase. We started back in 1982 uh, with a really modest festival. We just showed uh, 13 films over three days at the Pacific Film Archive in Berkeley. Um, since then, we've grown quite a bit. Um, in the early going in the 80s, it was a very grassroots event, um, very small and modest in um, scale uh, primarily focusing on a lot of documentary films, short films. There weren't a lot of narrative features being made at the time by Asian American filmmakers. Um, then uh, we started seeing a lot of Asian cinema becoming very popular in the U.S. And so parallel to the Asian American documentaries and the short films, we had a lot of Asian cinema, and I think that was part of the um, reason why we grew a lot in the early days, in addition to a lot of the outreach that we did with the uh, Asian American communities. 
And then you started to see a lot of Asian American filmmakers coming out of film school and making some very polished pieces and telling stories in the fiction realm. And it kind of culminated in the year 1997, just 10 years ago, when uh, we had world premieres of four Asian American narrative features, uh, including a couple of films by Justin Lin and uh, Chris Chan Lee, who returned with films this year too. The press at the time dubbed it Generation X um, because the films were very hip. They were young and edgy, and they were telling stories that were very different from the uh, generation gap comedies and the immigration stories that um, used to characterize Asian American films. Since then, we've just continued to grow. The diversity and the quality of films have just only gone better. And uh, last year, we finally reached uh, an audience size of 29,000. Uh, so we doubled our audience from uh, five years ago which makes us, I think, one of the most rapidly growing festivals in the Bay Area. Wow. So now, one of the uh, th introductions, let's say, Americans have had to films from Asia and involving Asian Americans is, of course, Bruce Lee. And, uh, and in fact, I think Bruce Lee's film, Enter the Dragon, probably predates the festival, if I remember right. I believe so, yes. About, yeah. yeah. So that's, and, and he actually, having grown up in the U.S., actually went to Asia to make films mm -hmm. and, and will, in fact, talk to... A filmmaker today, uh, Stefan Gauger, who also is Asian American and went to Vietnam to make a film. But how has filmmaking evolved for Asian Americans uh, in this country in terms of their being able to approach? I mean, we now actually have some fairly famous Asian American filmmakers, people who are born in this country, uh, who are in Hollywood, like Lucy Liu and M. Night Shyamalan. And, and they're, you know, big people, you know, in, in, in the just, you know, on par with every other uh, uh, do they come through uh, the festival? Is that the kind of yes. uh, person that you've... Many of the big Asian-American filmmakers, at least, um, who are out there uh, really making the films that are getting noticed in Hollywood right now did often come out of the film festival. Uh, the very first festival featured Chan is Missing from Wayne Wang, who went on to make The Joy Luck Club and many other um, well-known Hollywood films. Uh, M. Night Shyamalan had his first feature at our festival in 1993. It was called Praying with Anger, and that was the same year that we had the first feature by Ang Lee play at the festival, and it was called Pushing Hands. So many of the filmmakers that are out there right now really came out of the festival, and of course, Justin Lin um, is one of those. He's probably shown all of his short films and uh, was part of that 1997 watershed year and uh, made Better Luck Tomorrow, which was one of the turning points in Asian American films recently and comes back this year with Finishing the Game, which is on opening night tonight. And there's, in fact, a, a film, uh, if, if I'm not right, uh, wrong, and I, since I haven't seen all the films, I've only seen a few. There's a film that actually lampoons Bruce Lee and, his, uh, and Hollywood's uh, taking of Bruce Lee. Is, is, is that, that's the opening night film. Right. Um, basically, when... Bruce Lee passed away. He left about 12 minutes of footage of him uh, fighting with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and other films that were intended for his dream project. It was called The Game of Death. Um, he never got to finish it, but producers knew that they had to exploit the remaining footage somehow. They wanted to find a body double. And the film is basically a uh, spoof about the, uh, the casting process for this body double for Bruce Lee. So talk a little bit about some of the other fest films that are in the festival this year. You have, uh, for example, a special look at a Korean filmmaker. There is obviously a narrative competition and a documentary competition. Pick out some of your favorite films. Sure. Um, I'll start maybe with the closing night film, um, which I haven't mentioned and, and yet. And again, so the festival starts today, Thursday, and it goes for 10 days, but in San Francisco it goes till next Thursday. It goes on for 11 days, March 15th through 25th. Uh, the first eight days are in San Francisco. So the closing night actually takes place on Thursday, uh, March 22nd, just a week from now. And the film is Dark Matter uh, by Chen Shizheng, a Chinese uh, filmmaker who's been based out of New York for a while. He's a well-known opera director. Um, and the film is based on a true story. Um, and I won't go into too much of the details because it's giving away too much, but it's about a uh, Chinese cosmology student who comes to the U.S., uh, with high hopes and ambitions, and a lot of the uh, things that happen around him, the people that he encounters, start taking a toll on him until it escalates into something. Um, it stars uh, Liu Ye, who's a really well-known up-and-coming Chinese actor, Meryl Streep, who's a big star, and also Aidan Quinn. Um, it's a very dark film, not the typical closing night film, but I think uh, the people who come and uh, take a chance on it will be very, very impressed. And then it's act actually showing at the Palace of Fine Arts. It's a big exactly. theater and there's a party after that. Yeah, we actually have um, 
the announcement of the awards right after the screening. And uh, that's where we announced the awards for the uh, two competitions, the narrative competition and the documentary competition, which uh, comprise the heart of the festival. Um, there are 12 narrative features in the competition, and these are only for Asian-American, Asian-Canadian works. Um, and so, same thing for the documentaries. Uh, for the films from outside of North America, we have the International Showcase to show all the films from around Asia. Uh, we've di we did this to really highlight Asian-American films, which have always been our focus, more so than Asian films. Of course, there are tons of people in the Bay Area that are big fans of uh, international cinema. So those have always been popular. And the competition allowed us to really put a lot of the focus back on Asian American film. And we really started seeing that taking effect last year when we had a dozen Asian American features, which was twice the amount that we've had in previous years. And the sheer diversity and the quality of the works were staggering. And you see a lot of that again this year. You have everything from a romantic comedy like Lost in Translation set in Shanghai in the world premiere film Shanghai Kiss. You have uh, another film from Eric Byler, the uh, Hapa filmmaker who made Charlotte sometimes in uh, American Knees. Uh, you have a rotoscope animation film like Year of the Fish. You have uh, Boys in the Hood. Shot in New York, Chinatown. Yes, it is. And uh, you have a gangster film a la Boys in the Hood. It's another world premiere film called Baby. You have a mockumentary about zombies. You have a lot of different types of films, and that's really exciting to see. So that's the feature films. And in fact, we're going to be speaking with a couple of the filmmakers, Owl and the Sparrow, uh, which is a feature film made by a Vietnamese filmmaker, Vietnamese American filmmaker in Vietnam. And, uh, we'll be speaking with Joy Dietrich also, and that's a film actually shot in New York. So won't give away that part of the show yet. But, uh, let's talk a little bit about the documentary, uh, competition. You have, um, a half dozen films, I think. About we actually have eight films, eight films, of which three are world premieres, including Bolanel 52. And we'll who be speaking you'll with be the director of that, yeah. Um, we also have Koryo Saram, The Unreliable People, um, which is also a world premiere. And it's about the untold story of, um, uh, Soviet Koreans who were forced to live in Kazakhstan, um, during, uh, Stalin's time. And actually, if people listen to Apex Express regularly, when the film was being made, we actually interviewed the producer and played some cuts from almost a year ago now. So. Fantastic. So yeah. people get a chance to see it finally. Indeed, it's done now. And the last world premiere is Oh Saigon by um, Don Huang, which is another film about the Vietnamese experience. And in your international showcase, you have, again, about, I get six, seven films there, I think? Or? Twelve. Twelve, okay. Actually, sorry, thirteen. Um, there's something for everyone. We have an animated feature from Japan, The Girl Who Loved Through Time, which is just quite literally about a girl who leaves back in time. It's a delightful film. Uh, we have some gangster films like A Dirty Carnival from Korea and Exile from Hong Kong. Uh, we have a big blockbuster from Korea and King and the Clown. Uh, art films like Syndromes in a Century, Summer Palace. There really is something for everyone. And you have a focus on one particular filmmaker from Korea, and he is kind of an unusual filmmaker, and it seems like I've never seen any of his films, but from the descriptions, they have a striking similarity in their themes of, of love triangle. But tell us a little bit more about him. His name is Hong Sang-soo, and he's probably one of the most acclaimed international filmmakers working today. He's made seven films so far. We're showing all of them. And he's really one of the uh, uh, front runners of the South Korean new wave and uh, his films are all about human relationships, typically featuring uh, anywhere between three and four men and women in various permutations of romantic involvements, all lubricated with uh, alcohol, lots of drinking, lots of talking, and that leads to awkward sex, awkward moments, and a lot of things that are true about the way in which we try to make meaningful connections to one another but keep failing. Uh, they're fascinating films. They all speak to one another in interesting ways. And we're really delighted to have the filmmaker actually coming um, for much of the festival and will be present to do some Q&A. So I hope that uh, the cinephiles out there will not miss this opportunity. And, and that's one thing about the festival is many of the filmmakers will be there in person. And so even though some of these films may be uh, shown on public television or in mainstream theaters, uh, this is your opportunity to actually see and meet the filmmakers themselves. It's the dialogue. And we also have a lot of panel discussions where you have to actually get to hear from them um, very close, um, engaging in very specific topics, ranging from uh, the future of commercial Asian American cinema with Justin Lin and a couple of industry uh, representatives, and also uh, one panel involving Greg Araki, John Moritsugu, and uh, Roddy Bagawa talking about the bad boys of Asian American cinema, underground cinema in the 90s. Um, there's a lot of different things going on, even a master class with the cinematographer Ellen Kuras 
who uh, is the who shot uh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, which is um, uh, a favorite in, uh, among many top ten lists. And uh, she actually made a documentary called Narakun, which is a POV documentary uh, that will be pl- showing as a work in progress. And she'll be doing a 90-minute master class, and that's going to be a can't miss for any cinematographers out there. In the next couple of minutes that we have left to speak with you, Taro, maybe you can tell people how they can get uh, find out more about the films, look up the camp, look up the films themselves, and and buy tickets if they want to see the films. Well, you'll have to rush because tickets are starting to sell out already. One thing that everybody should know is that we used to do most of our screenings at the AMC Kabuki 8 theaters in Japantown. They've been sold to Sundance, been renovating right now. And so for this year, we are at the AMC Van Ness theaters, and there's a festival square there that has a box office. You can just go there in person and buy the tickets. Um, Otherwise, you can also buy them online, www.asianamericanfilmfestival.org. All the information is there. Again, www.asianamericanfilmfestival.org. People want more information. Is there a phone number they can call if they don't have access to the sure. Internet? 415-865-1588 is the hotline. And say that number one more time. 415-865-1588. And once again, it's the Center for Asian American Media. The film festival actually starts tonight, and it's running for the next week. Check it out. And, and some of the films uh, may be coming out into theaters or television in the not-too-distant future. Do you know any films that are planned for runs uh, uh, out in the upcoming uh, few months? Well, I think these films are actually just getting out in the festival circuit. They haven't been bought yet. But it is exciting to note that the opening night film and the closing night film from last year, American Ease and Journey from the Fall, respectively, are getting commercially released. In fact, Journey from the Fall, I think, is opening uh, in one week from now in Camera 12. Cinema but had you gone to the festival last year, you'd have seen it a year before it came out and, and met the actual filmmaker. Exactly. Indeed. Well, Taro Goto, thank you so much for joining us. Taro Goto is the assistant director of the Asian American Film Festival. And now as we move on, we will speak to some of the filmmakers. Uh, we'll speak first uh, to the producer of a film called And Thereafter, uh, let's listen to a short clip from that film. It is a film about a um, uh, a Korean prostitute who comes to the United States uh, as a war bride. So let's listen to a quick clip from that, and then we'll talk to the producer of the film. <laughs> And that's the voice of Ajuma, and she is in a documentary film about a Korean prostitute turned war bride, and she's singing a song in And Thereafter 2. Joining us now from New York is Hyun Ok Im, and she's the producer of the film And Thereafter 2. This is the second film in a trilogy, and it is a look by the Korean filmmaker Ho Suk Lee, who now lives and works in New York, at Korean war brides, women who came over, married American GIs, and came to the United States. They're both uh, uh, strong films, not for the faint of heart. Uh, they're looking at uh, the lives of these women, and they're very difficult lives. This particular woman who we just heard singing, and she's singing a song. The, the words of the song basically say, the day that the owl cried, a girl with nowhere to go, uh, no matter whom I ask, there's nowhere to go. Um, and uh, she, she's basically singing the song, talking about her own personal life, uh, Arjuma, the, the protagonist of the film, the fact that she ran away from home when her mother tried to marry her to an older man and how she became a sex worker and eventually married an American GI and came to the United States. We won't give away, there's a little twist in the tale, and we won't give this away because you'll have to watch the film. 
But uh, Xiong Hong, t- tell us a little bit about uh, the, the themes of the films as, as you see them. Tell us how Ho Sup and yourself track down these women uh, to tell their lives. And, and they are often incredibly sad tales of women uh, who have arrived in the United States and, and haven't quite been able to fit into the country. Yes, absolutely. I mean, just to give you a little bit of uh, statistics here, um, 100,000 uh, Korean women have married um, U.S. military um, since the Korean War. Um, that number has decreased um, considerably since the 80s. But what we're doing is we're looking at uh, uh, the personal lives of three of these women. Um, we have a trilogy, um, and we've just finished the second one, which is screening at the film festival. Um, the second one is called And Thereafter Two, and the first one is called And Thereafter One. And And Thereafter One is uh, is about an actual war bride in the 1950s who married an American soldier. Um, she, you know, was was had lost her family, and she came to the United States in the 50s. The second film, um, which is screening at the film festival, um, she's not so much a war bride as a woman who worked in um, what are called the camp towns around the U.S. bases that were set up throughout Korea um, by the United States and the South Korean governments, really, to provide, you know, U.S. soldiers. Um, there have been up to 45,000 uh, U.S. soldiers in um, Korea stationed there since um, 1953. And, and uh, so a lot of these women who work in these camp towns were prostitutes or bar girls. And so our story... And thereafter, too, is about one such woman, the woman who sang that song, which you just played. Um, she came to the States probably 20 years later uh, in the 70s, um, and uh, which is an interesting time in Korea because that's when Korea was developing industrially and becoming more of a consumer culture. Uh, this is is the third part in the trilogy. Not maybe uh, maybe it isn't even made yet. Again, going to follow that theme of Korean women who've come married American GIs and come to the United States. Yes, uh, yes. Um, all three films, you know, to get to, to get back to a thematic issue. I'm sorry, which which you asked in your original question. The thematics are, is really about isolation. Um, the third film is about a woman who came um, to the United States um, uh, more in current times, and she also came as a military bride. And her story is a different story. But what ties these three stories together and re- what really we found common with all the women that have been interviewed is isolation. They experience tremendous isolation and, and, and tremendous loneliness. There are um, many women who go on to have happy lives, but many of them come here. They're um, basically pariahs in Korean society, so they're outcasts in the United States, you know, amongst Korean Americans as well, because they have married into the American military, you know, as as uh, sex workers in many cases. Because of the language problem and the cultural difference, these women feel very isolated and they feel, you know, like the perpetual foreigner. And there are actually a lot of very unhappy marriages. And these are not films, as I said earlier, not for the faint of heart. They're not films that necessarily resolve. I mean, they're not Hollywood movies that you go back thinking, wow, well... You know, so they lived, and then they lived happily thereafter. In fact, exactly, it's, it's exactly. Yeah, I mean, thank you for um, putting it that way. I mean, that that's that's very good for top because you know the, the 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 title is and thereafter, and it is really an ironic title, you know, because that's what isn't isn't that what we uh, say in marriage ceremonies here and thereafter. Mm-hmm. So this is kind of the and thereafter dot dot dot. And the dot, dot, dot is that the women came here. They don't have happy endings or there isn't like some kind of wonderful narrative arc where there's trial and then there's good things that come about. So you're right. A lot of these stories, the ones that we illustrate are, you know, kind of sad and and bitter and, you know, hard stories to really take in. Why did you choose to do that? And and has that made it hard to find, let's say, funding, for example, in audiences? Because, you know, people are used to movies with happy endings. I've talked about it actually with a couple of friends and they say, well, we want to see a movie that ends well. And yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's 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 such a good point. I mean, especially, um, don't you think more and more, I, I think people with the documentaries, they want to see films that, you know, have happy endings or that at least have hopeful endings. Why do you choose such dark themes? I guess that's reality, but has it made it hard to find audiences and funding for um, films that are that dark? The director, his name is Hoso Lee. He's an he's you know, amazing uh, person and director. I respect him very much, enjoy working with him. He's, um, he is uh, uh, from the generation of student activists in the 80s in Korea and into the 1990s. There was a tremendous 
grassroots pro-democracy student movement, very, very difficult, very violent and anti-dictator movement. He's part of that generation of young people that were involved. Part of involved um, a very intense anti-Americanism, which uh, spread to um, larger Korean society as well. So coming from kind of that personal place, like that was his personal background, he had wondered at that time why, even though there was so much anti-Americanism in Korean society, why there continued to be so many women who married U.S. military, and these women were prostitutes or, or call girls or bar workers. And at that time, there was actually very little knowledge or um, consciousness in Korean society about these women. Most people really didn't know. And so he found out, and then, you know, he came to the United States several years ago, and he decided that this is a topic that he would approach because we feel that there, you know, are very unequal state-to-state relations between South Korea and the U.S. government. The U.S. government has many military troops in Korea. The director really wanted to show how a person-to-person relationship is the real kind of human consequence of these political relationships. And then, of course, he gets into these really personal stories. In terms of uh, finding audiences, the first one about the war bride, I can't tell you. It just did so tremendously well. It, It went to dozens of film festivals. We won several awards. You know, as you probably know, um, outside of... And that's actually probably the more depressing of the two films, the more stark. Pardon me? It's probably the more depressing of the two films, the more stark in terms of what happens to the woman uh, in her life, uh, the first film. Yes, yes, I I think that's true. I I think that may be true as well. Well, she's she's a much elderly woman, so, you know, you do see that she's had more of this difficulty throughout her life. The first film has done very, very well. Um, you know, with critics and audiences at film festivals, you know, in, in the way that really good documentaries will. We don't know how well it will continue to do in terms of broadcast and whatnot. That's our hope. The second one, we're hoping that it also does really well at film festivals. A lot of uh, documentaries, that's kind of the place where you receive a lot of favorable response and where people talk about your film, and that becomes your community, really. You know, of course, our hope is to have it broadcast as well. So, you know, we'll see we'll see where it goes, but you're right. I mean, to bring up the point that films that have darker scenes or darker stories are hard sells, I mean, to put it in <laughs> in real plain terms. But they're important to make and well worth telling. Since these films are actually made by a Korean filmmaker about Korean women who have come to the United States, have they gotten an audience or reception back in South Korea? Oh, yes. The first one um, did very well in South Korea. Um, the second one, the director um, has Already, uh, you know, he, he's talking with a broadcast station about having it broadcast in Korea. There is great interest, and this is a, a really great development from, say, you know, back in the 80s when there was actually very little knowledge about these films, about, excuse me, about the subject matter. Hyunok, um, thank you so much for joining us. Again, if people uh, want to see the films, they are at the Asian American Film Festival, and you can go to www.asianamericanfilmfestival.org to find out more. Both Hosop Lee and yourself, you know, Kim, are going to be at the festival uh, to talk to people if they come to see your films? It's, yeah, exactly, and, and, the, and the director, he's, uh, he's the one that did all the great work, Hosop Lee. I'm, I'm sorry he couldn't be here tonight, and we, we want to thank you very much, Pratap, for having us here, and also just a very important big thank you to the Center for the Asian American Media for helping us to make this film. You know, thank you so much again. Thank you very much. Our next film actually also looks at alienation. It looks at the alienation actually of young Asian American women. And in fact, uh, Joy Dietrich in her director's statement talks about how Asian American have, women have the, one of the highest rates of depression in the United States. And this film doesn't attempt to explain those reasons, but it portrays this one woman. It's a story of a Korean adoptee in the United States and how she struggles to come to terms with her, the incestuous relationship she finds herself in with her brother in her host family. Let's listen to a clip uh, from the film in which she uh, talks about this with a newfound friend and, and you know, is, is struggling to get her words out. So let's, let's, let's play a little bit of that and then we'll speak with Jai Dietrich, who made the film. He said, uh, he said I'm an imitation. A copycat. It's just one guy's opinion. He 
he's right. I'm just a pretender trying to pass for something I'm not. I hated being the black sheep. Felt like a deformity in my family. I'll never know what it would be like to feel natural in my family. You and Sandy have that. It comes without thought. I would have given anything to feel that connection with my brother. I was 14. He was 17. They ended up kicking me out of the house. Sent me off to Aunt Molly's while they kept the real son safely at home. Jenny, what happened? Why'd they kick you out? Well, you'll have to watch the film to find out more about exactly what happened. But for the moment, let's talk to Joy Dietrich, uh, the filmmaker. It's a very... Uh, poignant moment in the film where Jenny Mason and uh, she's actress Kim Jiang plays the role of this young woman who's moved from the Midwest I guess I forget exactly where from the name of the film I forgot to uh, mention actually is Tie a Yellow Ribbon Joy Dietrich, uh, thank you so much for joining us on, at KPFA uh, Thanks for having me So talk a little bit about the film and, and your process in making it this is a story uh, about a uh, young woman who moves to New York. Uh, you live in New York. How much of the story is uh, based on people you know and um, your own experiences uh, in, in tracking the lives of Korean Americans and Korean adoptees in the United States? Well, actually, Thai Yellow Ribbon started as a... Um, I, first, I started writing these uh, short stories about just, um, you know, um, just kind of art little stories and then um, then I came upon this statistic um, just you know fooling around I was you know looking for ideas to do my next film I, I've done two short films and this was my first feature film and so then I came across a statistic that Asian American uh, young women have uh, one of the highest rates of depression and and suicides in the country in the United States and I thought wow that's really uh, I, I didn't know that. And so I, 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 I really wanted to make a film about, um, you know, Asian American young women who really rarely get any um, uh, voice in uh, in, uh, in media. They really rarely get exposed. And uh, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, I think it, things have improved over the uh, the last couple of years. But before, you really uh, didn't see that many uh, roles for Asian American actors and. So I, I really wanted to do a film about uh, Asian American young women. So how it started was, um, you know, I thought, okay, so I would have three. I'm going to talk about, uh, examine the lives of three women um, and their sort of often troubled search for love, connection, acceptance. I think that uh, for a lot of us, uh, you know, because we don't see positive role models in American society, uh, that we uh, sometimes... Uh, our self-worth, um, our, our self-esteem gets damaged in the process. So the main character, um, Ginny Mason, uh, she's a little um, emotionally distant. She is a Korean adoptee, and, and uh, there's something uh, about her that's sort of frozen. And um, so she, she moves into a new apartment building and crosses paths with the two other Asian-American young women, B and Sandy. Um, and... Um, and she um, gets to know them, and uh, B is this really beautifully fragile former model, but she is also very vulnerable, you know, and, uh, you know, we don't know why. She's beautiful. She's smart. And she tries to, you know, please everybody, even her parents from her and her sort of boyfriend who uh, has a bit of an Asian fetish, um, and then um, but kind of neglects her own desire and wishes. Sandy is the third person I, I uh, talk about in the film, and she uh, she's a bit socially awkward and lets people boss her around. And you know, overall, in, in, when as the film progresses, each of these characters will um, have to decide how would they deal with the obstacles that they come before them. Jenny is uh, keeps everybody at arm's length. Uh, Sandy's brother 
Simon has a bit of a crush on her, but she, you know, runs away from attachment, even though she desperately wants to connect. So how do all three women uh, come up, you know, uh, deal with uh, the problems and issues that they will face as an Asian American woman? And, um, and who will um, ultimately uh, take the first step to connect and who will survive and who will not? So that is like the general gist of the film. And so when, when uh, as, uh, me, uh, as a Korean adoptee, I am also, um, I talk to a lot of, uh, you know, women who, you know, like me, had, uh, you know, faced a lot of uh, racism growing up in a predominantly white uh, community. And, um, and I don't think people realize uh, that, you know, we as Asian American young women do uh, also face some prejudices, and and uh, one friend of mine, a close friend of mine, said, "What kind of why would they, you be uh, um, targeted?" And uh, and we do. And I, I I'm and not only from the Korean adoptee experience. I'm just talking about uh, status as an Asian American woman. And so uh, I really, really wanted to write a film and make a film about this. And um, so I did. So talk a little bit about yourself, because uh, you're actually you didn't train at a film school, and in fact you're a journalist who works uh, at the New York Times. This is kind of an unusual departure, um, and and it's in in fact your first feature film. Even I think you've made a film before, but not a feature film. Yes, I've I've, I've done two short films, and um, no, I did not go to film school. I've um, had enough of school. I was. <laughs> came into filmmaking rather late and um i th- you know i think uh uh filmmaking is a is a uh uh it requires a lot to do films and i i think if you do go to film school um you know you probably uh benefit from all the connections that you'll make uh i think that's the only thing that i lacked from not going to film school but otherwise you really have to use your experience your um Writing capabilities, your uh, your ability to tell stories. Um, so, in 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 that respect, um, me being a journalist beforehand and currently, um, rather it was kind of helpful to transition from that to film. And uh, so, I, I I continue to work at the New York Times and uh, and you know try and make films. <laughs> And uh, this, and how about the actors and actresses who are involved in your film? Are they people that, uh, in in making a film without film training and without connections in the film business, was that hard to find people in New York? I heard. Well, generally, if you think about it, um, again, um, there are very little roles for Asian American uh, actors, and so I I think that even if uh, I try to get somebody like now Sandra Oh is very popular and uh, you know um, uh, Lucy uh, I'm, I'm blanking out on her Lucy Liu probably is yeah somebody. and uh, Joan Chen and uh, all these people uh, but the, the, pro- the thing is that uh, these roles were you know uh, young women in the early 20s and can you think of somebody in uh, in our uh, actor world uh, in could fill that role right now I mean, these other women are in their um, 30s, and so I, it wasn't. So I could have gotten, try to get better, um, or well, not better, but well, more well-known cast. But then there isn't anybody that I could, could have thought of that I would want it for these parts. So it's very much a film using your resources and 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 in fact tapping into into uh, recent graduates and, and people working. As uh, actors, we did a, you know, uh, a long uh, casting process. Um, we um, basically just cast out of New York City, um, and uh, there were quite a number of people who showed up. Uh, I think we must have uh, looked at, uh, I mean, close to three, 400 people. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh you know, I think there there are a lot of people out there who want to have a chance to, you know, have these roles and interesting roles too. And are there many uh, people in the Korean American adoptee community uh, that are sort of in this world? I noticed that uh, your um, your principal actress uh, uh, Kim Jong is she Korean American? Uh, 
No, she's Chinese American. She's Chinese American. Actually, the uh, the main character of the film is a Korean adoptee, and the other two, uh, one, uh, Sandy, um, is a Chinese American, and Beatrice is a sort of a mix of uh, of you know different ethnicities, um, but still Asian American. And so, um, so I just you know wanted to really discuss just the experiences of an Asian American woman, and and the main character is a Korean adoptee, so there is a uh, Issues that uh, about the Korean adoptee experience that is discussed, uh, you know. So um, I did think that that was important as well. Jai Dietrich, her film is called Tie Yellow Ribbon, and it's going to be playing. You're coming uh, to the festival. You'll be here at the I festival. I am. I'm, I am going to uh, attend with my uh, uh, few act- my main actors on Sunday, March 18th at 7 p.m. And that's at the Van Ness. And there's a second screening, I think, on March 21st at 9.30 p.m., uh, also at the Van Ness. So, that's, um, that's correct. And uh, also the, uh, there will be actors uh, doing the Q&A um, there as well. So once again, if you want to see Tie Yellow Ribbon by Joy Dietrich, uh, do go to the Film Festival website or go to the Van Ness directly. And uh, that website is AsianAmericanFilmFestival.org. Joy Dietrich, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And moving on, we have two more uh, directors who are going to join us. One in studio, we're going to have Dirk Nguyen, who will join us. He lives in the Bay Area, and will also be joined by Stefan Gauger, and he's in Los Angeles. The two films that we'll be talking about, one is a feature film, and one is a documentary. Uh, Stefan Gauger's film is The Owl and the Sparrow, and it's set in Vietnam. And it uh, is the story of a young girl who sells flowers in the streets of Saigon. The documentary film is about a Vietnamese boat refugee who returns from the United States to make her peace uh, with the South China Sea and the people who lost their lives in their ordeal to reach the Philippines uh, after leaving Vietnam. Let's start actually by listening to a clip from uh, Stefan Gauger's film. It's called, as I said, The Owl and the Sparrow. And it's in Vietnamese, unfortunately, so if you don't speak Vietnamese, basically to set the scene, it is uh, a, a busy street in Saigon, and the, the little girl is selling roses. It's her first day selling roses. Roses, I'm sorry. And so she approaches uh, a young woman who's an air hostess, who's sitting in, and, and eating a bowl of soup, and asks her if she'll buy a um, rose from her. And the woman initially says no. Stefan, you yourself were born in uh, Vietnam and you grew up in Orange County. Um, let's talk a little bit about your film. Your film of the young girl who flees her, her uncle's factory, her parents are dead, and she's trying to make a living selling roses. How did you come to make a film about uh, young Vietnamese street children? I've uh, come across a lot of these kids. Uh, uh, probably beginning in 1994, which was the first time I had gone back to to Vietnam, uh, which is the city I was born in. And at the time, it was much poorer than it is now, uh, 13 years later. Uh, but um, <clears throat> even back then, they were you know they were selling lottery tickets, and then subsequently I would go back every every few years, and, and you know I'd befriend a lot of these kids. But I was always fascinated about. Uh, their kind of situation, their their lot in life, as far as you know, trying to go to school and and elevating their 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 selves in the world by having an education, but at the same time being so poor that they have to uh, supplement their uh, their you know their their they have to pay for their school books and their uniforms by uh, making some extra cash at night. 
And in fact, in the little segment that we listened to a few moments ago, uh, she's trying to make her first sale of uh, roses. And she asks this young woman with all the naivete of, of, of youth, you know, buy one for your husband. And she says, well, I don't have a husband. And she says, well, buy one for your boyfriend. And, and, the, and the air hostess is trying to, and of course, as the air hostess has her own tale that one will discover if you watch the film. But maybe tell, tell people a little bit more about the film and, and how it unfolds without giving away the end of the story. <coughs> it's, it's a very, very traditional kind of uh, a structured film where uh, the orphan girl, uh, um, you know, my themes that I like to, to, um, to write about are uh, one big one is, is dislocation in the big city. And uh, so this little girl running into the city uh, who's alone, is, is bringing together uh, two adults that care for her, and uh, so she's playing matchmaker to these two adults from very uh, different classes. Uh, one being an air hostess, and one being a um, you know a, a, a zookeeper who's kind of cut off from society. Basically, it is very traditional, but I wanted to execute it in a more non-traditional way by employing certain avant-garde techniques like jump cuts and handheld cameras and. and mostly available light, just to give the city of Saigon a 2007 feel, which is very um, very hustle and bustle and, and very energetic. And how did you find your actors and actresses? The young girl, she doesn't seem very old at all, but she's, she's obviously a very good actress. She is. Uh, she's very, very natural. She she's, was a gem to find. Um, I was extremely fortunate. She had uh, never acted before uh, for the camera, and um, her mother is a dance instructor, uh, so she had done some chorus work on stage, so I, I think that she knew how to take direction. Sometimes that's different from being able to translate those emotions onto the viewer uh, with the camera, and, and she was able to do that uh, in a way that wasn't forced. Uh, so she's just a natural, and uh, I was just lucky because I, I didn't have much time to cast, and, and I only saw maybe 10 girls, and, and she was the one that had the most potential. And, and uh, as we were shooting, I, I, I kind of knew that, you know, she would carry the film. Uh, but she only had uh, two days um, before we started shooting to, to you know, get all her dialogue in, and, and, uh, and, and she was able to do that uh, at, at such a young age and still, still get the character. She was still able to kind of uh, embody that, that little girl who sells streets, uh, flowers on the streets. And what was it like going back to make a film in Asia? You were born in Asia, but you've grown up here uh, as a Vietnamese American making a film in Vietnam. How did people approach you and uh, wh how, what did they think of your project? <coughs> um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I, uh, um, I had experience working in Vietnam uh, as a technician, basically as a cameraman and as a lighting technician on other Films. So I had already known the system of, you know, how to get permits and, and, and you know, uh, as far as searching for crews and, and finding the right people. I basically uh, uh, wanted to attract a younger crew um, as far as the producers and, and, and just because there's a, a, a kind of um, a new energy where they want to tell new stories. So when they knew that I was doing a film that was very minimal as far as crew, and uh, using digital cameras, they don't really use digital cameras over there. Uh, mostly, they're 35 millimeter productions, and, and I was running around in a very kind of um, <clears throat> French New Wave style, and, and they just didn't know what to make of, of, of my uh, my my way of shooting because I, I would do scenes on open streets with an uh, uh, amazing amount of traffic noise. And um, and they just weren't used to that kind of uh, out and the open kind of shooting style. Uh, let me ask you, uh, Duke, since we have both of you here, they're very different films, even though you're both Vietnamese American. In shooting your film, you traveled to the Philippines and you traveled to Japan. How did people react to you as a Vietnamese American filmmaker coming to shoot a film about Vietnam? Uh, were they curious about? Uh, about you and, 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 and why you want to make the film? Well, we also have a very, very minimal crew. It basically consists of uh, me, an associate producer, and a camera person. 
We have a really small crew. We were very conspicuous. When we traveled to Bali now, of course, people see the camera and they were curious, but they didn't think of it much uh, of a, like a film production. They probably think of a TV crew coming down. It's a fishing village, uh, very small and by, very uh, isolated. So, Duke Nguyen joins us. His film is uh, about uh, the boat people and about uh, people who left uh, Vietnam and uh, set out on the open sea. But, Duke, you're with us. So, tell us the story of your film. Yes, uh, the film is called Boli Now 52, and uh, the name are derived from uh, uh, Boli Now is a village in uh, the Philippines where this particular boat was rescued to after they drift at sea for 37 days. Uh, 52 is uh, the f- number of people survive out of 110 original passengers on the boat. Um, so, uh, the f- the, excuse me, the film is about the journey of uh, um, the Bolina 52. And now you yourself uh, came to the United States as a boat person. So you did you travel the same route more or less? Correct. Um, I came to United States in 1980, and uh, we left Vietnam in the same area as the Bolina 52 uh, out of the Mekong River. Um, and uh, we were heading to Malaysia, which is the same uh, destination that the Bolina 52 was heading toward. Uh, the irony um, between my stories and the Bolina 52 is my boat was rescued by the U.S. Navy ship versus the Bolina 52 was abandoned by U.S. Navy ship. And this, this uh, obviously, it's a documentary. It's a true story. It's quite tragic because the the people on the boat have to resort to, if I may say, cannibalism. And so this is a, a big topic for the film uh, in terms of trying to discuss what actually happened uh, on the boat and to come to terms with it, and 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 also to come to terms with the the, the ship, as you said, that abandoned uh, the the boat people and the people that were involved in that. So. How how did you now? Uh, I'm I'm not sure how what your boat ride was like when you came to the U.S. Were you at sea for as long uh, a time, and was it quite as arduous as as the film shows? Our boat was considered a uh, a lucky case because uh, we were at sea only for four days, and uh, after that we were um, encountered. Um, a U.S. Navy ship and rescued by U.S. Navy ship. So. Um, um, among boat people experience, uh, we, we have the, the fortunate case versus the Boeing F-52 is one of the, uh, the unfortunate cases, um, which led to a dark, um, experience that they had to encounter. And so why did you choose to make, uh, a film about Bolina 52 as opposed to maybe your own personal journey? Um, yes, um, originally I was, um, I was interested in making a, um, a film about my own experience, but I felt that uh, in order to tell the the real side of the story of the the tragedy uh, both Vietnamese boat people experience um, is to find a story that really uh, dig deep down into the heart of uh, the darkness of of the journey itself. Let, let's uh, play actually a little clip uh, from unless this is going to be complicated. Let's play a little clip from from the film which actually sets that scene and we'll talk a little bit more, more about it and I think we have Stefan on the uh, line now so we'll talk to him in a second but since we've gotten talking about Bolinao 52 let's play a little uh, clip which actually introduces the film and, and how people feel about the, the trip All of us Vietnamese boat people took the course across the South China Sea that decided our fate. Some made it alive while others fell behind. But the Boli Now 52 story made headlines due to its misfortune. Among boat people, this is one of those boats that met its dark fate. forbidden topic at a dinner table. When such tragedy is mentioned, everyone either stay quiet, stray from the discussions, or make jokes about it. On these journeys, 
replaces our lives as a wager for survival. Some were carried to the bottom of the oceans by giant waves. Some pushed off course by strong wind. Some slaughtered and killed by pirates. Others overcame death to survive. We have a saying: "Ra đi là chuyện bất ngờ. Dù mưa dù nắng, thân mình chẳng hay." It means departing is unpredictable. Rain or shine, you never know. And again, that's a clip from a film Bolinau 52 joining us in the studio right here on listener sponsored KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, is the director of the film, and his name is Duc Nguyen. Um, So, Duke, uh, in making this film, in fact, you were able to trace some of the footage of the individuals uh, of, of that were uh, involved in this tragedy, not just the protagonist herself who returns to make her peace with the village of Bolinau and the lives that were lost, but also people who were on the boat that refused to pick them up. And and so part of the film is actually the encounter with uh, the one of the sailors, the U.S. Navy sailors, And and in fact, in in a somewhat ironic twist, the fact that the the woman who came to the United States, her son, then actually joins the Marines himself. Yes, correct. So tell us a little bit about that process of deciding how you to pick those particular characters to tell that story. Uh, the fact that one of them is in the Marines and and and, and trying to reconnect uh, to the um, to the boat experience. Um, right. Actually, in fact, I. Uh The characters came to me. Um, I, in the beginning, I was searching for um, any survivors from the Bolina 52, and I didn't have any luck for uh, over two years. Uh, finally, I uh, went on a radio station, a Vietnamese-based uh, language uh, radio station based in Orange County, uh, Southern California, and uh, um able to locate one of the survivors through the the radio station because her sister was driving to work and listened to the radio program um, and uh, called me afterward and uh, let me know um, that uh, her family members were on the boat. So that's how I located um, uh, Tung Trin, the uh, main character in the film. Um, um, and be- But before that, I uh, was able to locate uh, Bill Clunan is... Um, a witness from the USS Dubuque uh, through uh, uh, another captain who rescued other boat people. Um, and, um, and Bill Clunan's wish was to uh, uh, meet, the, you know, any survivors from the Bowling F-52 for his own closure or redemption uh, of a guilt that he'd been carrying. Now, it wasn't his, his fault that the, the people were not picked up, but he felt guilty nonetheless. Because yes, it was not his fault. In fact, um, he uh, believed that uh, they should have picked up the Bolina 52, and uh, he felt angry, uh, you know, uh, uh, about the decision that the captain made, which is, which is uh, abandon the, the boat. In the screenings of the film, if you're interested, The Owl and the Sparrow plays at the AMC Van Ness on Sunday, March 18th at 4.45 p.m. and on Tuesday, March 20th at 6.45 p.m. And that's also the AMC Van Ness. For more information, go to the San Francisco Asian American Film Festival website, which is asianamericanfilmfestival.org. And... Um, Uh, by the way, in case people want to call, the number is 415-863-0814. Again, 415-863-0814. Uh, Duke Nguyen, what do you plan to do next? Are you going to make uh, more films, documentary films? Would you like to get into feature films? What What, what are your plans? I, 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 I love documentary, so I think I'm probably going to stick with documentary, um, you know, unless there's an uh, excellent script come my way. I, I would like to try to, you know, do a feature film, uh, you know, maybe a comedy, because <laughs> uh, dealing with, um, you know, serious subject matter can take a toll on, on you uh, emotionally at times. But, um, yeah, I'd like to, you know, maybe kind of let's see what happens. Okay, and once again, your film is showing uh, Monday, March 19th at the Asian American Film Festival. That's at 6.30 p.m. at the AMC Van Ness, March 19th. 
and Saturday in San Jose at 2.30 p.m. at the Camera 12 Cinemas. And I imagine, hopefully, because San Jose being San Jose, you'll get a large Vietnamese-American uh, contingent turning out to see the film. Um, so once again, uh, for information on that film, AsianAmericanFilmFestival.org. The phone number is 415-863-0814. Stefan Gauga, I want to thank you again for joining us and Duk Nguyen for waiting patiently till the end of this program. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Pratap Chatterjee. Thanks also to Rose Kitabji, who are engineered this show, uh, and Chris, as well as Jinnah Hutta. Thanks so much, and uh, we'll uh, join you next week. And this is KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFC in Fresno. Stay tuned for uh, Bonnie Simmons' show.